Welcome to the Next Society's webinar on intestinal development and injury. We're really grateful to have you here joining us today. This webinar is uh, presented in partnership with Pediatric Research and Engage, Grow, Thrive. We're really grateful for their partnership. And we work hard at the Next Society to keep babies and families centered in everything that we do. And we're grateful to dedicate today's webinar to baby Matilda. Those are the photos you see here. Matilda and her twin sister were born prematurely and initially they were both doing well. Um, but tragically, Matilda developed necrotizing squitis and she unfortunately died from this disease. And her twin sister is doing well today. Um, and we are grateful to her family for honoring Matilda and carrying her memory and sharing her memory with us and believing in our vision of a world without neck and helping us to advance our vision. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. We have a lot to cover today. So if anyone is just getting to know the Next Society, welcome. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's dedicated to building a world without neck. We bring together patient families who've been personally affected, clinicians, researchers, other diverse stakeholders to advance research, education, and advocacy. So here are some photos from pre-pandemic when we were able to get together in person and we hope to get back to these times at some, um, at some point soon. If you are curious to learn more about some of the work that we do, if you're not so familiar with us, you can check out, check out our impact reports. We actually have these available um, for years going back all the way to 2016 in terms of what we, um, some of our proudest accomplishments over the years. And so our 2021 impact report is available on nextsociety.org if you'd like to check it out. Here are our speakers for today. We're really excited to welcome everyone. Um, I'm not going to go into introductions now because that's what Jay and Eleanor are going to be doing momentarily, but I just want to highlight and say thank you to everyone for being here. And I should also introduce myself. Um, I'm Jennifer. I'm the founder and executive director of the Next Society. I lost my son Micah to complications of the disease just before his first birthday and um, really feel privileged and honored to be here with all of you and to do this work. So just a quick um, reminder before I hand it over to Eleanor, um, the Next Society is not providing medical advice and all of our speakers' views are independent from us as an organization. So Eleanor, I'm going to hand it over to you so you can share your screen. Thank you so much. That was lovely. And it's, um, it's wonderful to see the Next Society um, uh, having this fantastic webinar. And I'm um, just going to share. Um, and really, we were so privileged. Um, I, sometimes people don't know that pediatric research is a journal, hence I'm doing this very quick slide. But it's a journal that represents um, a lot of research societies, the American Pediatric Society, the Society for Pediatric Research and the European Society for Pediatric Research. And we were so lucky that the next society um, and colleagues approached us with their series, which is published in the journal and re is related to this webinar. So if you want to read more, read the journal and look at this. And we really want to support societies like the next society who are so incredibly successful. Uh, and just to say, I suppose our team um, and Cynthia Barry is, Bear is the editor-in-chief and I'm the associate editor-in-chief. We're really interested in, I suppose, um, promoting especially parents-led societies and again, building a world without neck. So, and the revenue really does go back to the societies and to the members. I know that uh, it's difficult in publishing and um, please look at our website for more information. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to my co-chair. I'm gonna stop sharing there um, and we can start introductions. Thanks. Great, thanks, Eleanor. So Eleanor and myself, Jay Kim, uh, are gonna moderate the session. We've got four terrific speakers to present today on intestinal development and injury. And we're excited about uh, the discussion that follows each of their, their talks. We've kind of instructed them to really dive deep uh, right away. So there won't be a lot of preamble about necrotizing enterocolitis, but they're going to talk about the specific areas of interest. And hopefully that composite will really lead to some great discussion at the end. So our first speaker, we'll just move forward, is Dr. Steve McElroy, who's uh, a fellow uh, scientific advisor with the Next Society. He's a neonatologist and, a, and the current division chief at UC Davis. And he said, uh, long-standing interest in, in bowel injury and its repair mechanisms, uh, particularly focusing on some unique uh, phenomenon with the pennant cells and goblet cells in, in the intestinal tract, um, and is uh, really trying to shed some new light into how uh, the role of these, the, the development of the gut uh, plays a role in 
uh, diseases like necrotizing enterocolitis. So I'm going to hand over the floor to Dr. McElroy. All right. Thanks, Jay, uh, for that introduction. And thank you to Jen and the Next Society for giving me a chance to talk. Um, and is everybody good with this or did it flip up to the presenter? Yeah, flipped. Okay, hang on. There we go. Better? Perfect. Awesome. All right, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, pregnancy and what happens in pregnancy and what that may have to do with necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, I do have some disclosures to talk about. Um, I am on the scientific advisory board for the Next Society, as well as advisory boards for Lactologics, Noviome, and Vernix. And I do have a collaboration uh, with Defense and Therapeutics, but I won't be talking about any of that research today. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about prematurity and chorioamnionitis and why that's important. Uh, we know that uh, prematurity is a big deal. About one in 10 kids is born preterm uh, in the U.S., and there are lots of things that can cause prematurity to happen, but the leading cause of prematurity we think is chorioamnionitis or inflammation of the fetal membranes, the placenta and the amniotic fluid. And there's some interesting things with this. The, the first is that um, it depends on when you're born as to how uh, common choreo is, is a participant. So the younger you are when you're born, the more likely it is due to chorioamnionitis as a cause. The other interesting thing is that while we believe that choreo happens because of a microbial invasion uh, of the amniotic cavity, there's also this uh, phenomenon known as sterochoriamnionitis, where you get the inflammation that's seen, um, but you don't grow any microorganisms. And, and that's important because what it may mean is that the inflammation is, is really problematic and not necessarily the thing that causes the inflammation. So why am I talking about this in the next society? Well, because there's this known association with necrotizing enterocolitis and being exposed to chorioamnionitis as a fetus, so much so that now um, this, this article, this meta-analysis is almost 10 years old, um, but the Wolf's group um, ran a meta-analysis of studies that have been done looking at this association between neck and chorioamnionitis. And they found that indeed there is an association between the two disease processes. Um, but they also found that there was a dose dependence where the more severe your choreo was, the more likely you were to develop neck later as, uh, as an offspring. So we know that there's this, this connection between neck and, and development of or exposure to chorioamnionitis as a fetus. But what always struck me was it didn't make sense why. So choreo happens at birth. You'd think that if it was a causative problem, the, then the, the issue that followed it would happen shortly after birth. But neck occurs typically weeks after you're born. And so nobody really could understand why these two things were linked and, and what exposure to this inflammation as a fetus had to do with you developing neck several weeks later. So what we did as a lab is we said, well, let's, let's look at this. And we turned to the mouse and the mouse can be a really powerful tool for understanding human biology and, and the biology of the preterm infant. And the reason why is because the gut of mammals develops in the same pattern regardless of what mammal you are. What's different is when you're born in the process. And so while humans have typically a completely mature intestine by the time they're born at term, mice are born much earlier in the process. And to really kind of hammer this home, this is a study that we did now several years ago um, that we looked at 20 different genes that are present in both mi mice and humans. And we just across their developmental time frame and development of the gut, we looked at the, the relative amounts of these genes that were present in the tissues. And then we compared the two species. And what it showed was exactly that, that a term human infant is roughly similar to a four-week-old mouse, but <clears throat> the preterm infants at the limits of viability, those, those 22, 23, 24 week old infants are more similar to about a two week old mouse uh, or a little bit younger. And so it really helped us say that at least from an epithelial standpoint, 
we could look at what's going on in the mouse and that may give us insights as to what's happening in our preterm infants in the NICU. So the next thing we needed to do is we needed to come up with a model to, to look at chorea amnionitis. And there are lots and lots of models and, and ways to do this. We specifically wanted to look at the role of inflammation and we wanted to do that without having to worry about um, what was going on with uh, microorganisms uh, in play. And so what we chose to do is we chose to inject um, pregnant mice with lipopolysaccharide, which is a component of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria, and it causes a robust inflammation. And we did this at uh, day 15.5 of pregnancy. A mouse pregnancy is about 19 and a half or 20 days. And we used 100 uh, micrograms per uh, kilo of body weight of, of the mouse. And when we injected into these mice, you can see the, the outcomes off on the side, um, which uh, in panel A is looking at the serum uh, in these pregnant mice. And you can see there's a robust increase in cytokines. So looking at interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, and TNF, which are three common cytokines that are often uh, talked about with chorea amnionitis. And there's a huge increase in these in mice that are treated with LPS versus the sham, and the LPS isn't red. Throughout the rest of these slides, I'll be talking with this choreo model as FEMI, which is the fetal exposure to maternal inflammation. And so I stay away from choreo because we're not using bacterial um, uh, inducers, but rather we're using this inflammation uh, exposure of the fetus. In panel B, you can see that this inflammation doesn't just immediately go away. And so this is looking at the placenta right before birth at day 19. And there's still a robust increase in the inflammatory markers in, in these placentas. And so the this exposure to uh, this uh, fetal uh, inflammation is extensive and lasts through a big chunk of pregnancy. You can see in panel C, that's looking at the um, neonatal mice. And so it extends over to the, the mice after they're born. And the last panel is just looking at the presence of LPS. One of the things that we wanted to do was make sure that this uh, was not crossing the placenta and causing a direct impact on the offspring. And, and it did not, in our hands, we can only see LPS present in the mom that we injected into. So what does this have to do with the intestine? Well, two fellows that worked in my lab, um, Tim Elgin and Aaron Fricke, were really instrumental in, in putting forth some of this work. But early on, what we did is we exposed pregnant mice to this, this uh, LPS and created FEMI. And then we just let the, the offspring deliver and we harvested their intestines at different time points and looked at them to see what it did. And you can see here the 0, 1, 2, 3 are examples of histology of these intestines. We use um, this grading scale to look at injury. Zero is basically normal, one is a mild injury, and two is a more severe injury. And when we looked at the offspring of these animals, they um, at birth had a significantly increased injury compared to sham. So in red, you can see these are the animals that were exposed to LPS as a fetus. The injury score is off on the y-axis and the age of life of the offspring are down here on the x-axis. And you can see two things with this. One, the injury score is always higher for animals that are exposed to uh, this fetal inflammation. And two, you have an increased uptick in the beginning right after they're born, but you also have this increase further on. And we thought that was really interesting and kind of spoke to the susceptibility to further injury. Now, the first data that I showed you is without any further subsequent hit. So it's just that initial exposure. We then went the next step and said, well, what happens if you have a second exposure to a similar inflammatory process. And so you can see here in this panel, the sham animals that have nothing done to them, the femi animals, which were the ones that were exposed to this initial inflammation during pregnancy and nothing else. These are all P7 mouse, mice, sorry. Um, the NI group are those that are exposed to neonatal inflammation. And so these are seven day old mice that did not have any exposure to inflammation when they were um, still fetuses, but they were given a, a um, weight adjusted uh, similar dose of LPS when they were seven days old. And likewise, you can see this DI, this is animals that were exposed to FEMI 
and then we're at seven days given a second hit of this LPS exposure. And you can see those animals were the ones that had significantly increased injury compared to everyone else, which basically to us meant that if you were exposed to inflammation as a fetus, you were then uh, at a higher increased risk of having intestinal injury if you have a second hit later on in life. We further went on to see that uh, interleukin-6 is really critical to this uh, intestinal injury process. When we did this FEMI model in mice that were lacking interleukin-6, we could not induce injury. Um, that was not true when we had mice that were lacking uh, tumor necrosis factor or receptor one, or in RAG knockout animals that had non-functioning T and B cells. And so interleukin-6 really is critical to this process of causing downstream intestinal injury. So the next thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to turn to an animal model of necrotizing enterocolitis because that's really what my lab is interested in. And so we use the, the NEC model that my lab has developed, which is the Panacell disruption model of NEC. This particular model uses two-week-old mice, and it's a two-hit process where we disrupt PANA cells um, through several methods, but the, the most common one is through use of the, the chemical dithizone. We follow that six hours later with giving a gavage of Klebsiella pneumoniae to cause a dysbiosis in the intestine. And animals that were exposed to those two hits will develop a huge inflammatory surge in about three hours after that second hit. And then about six to 10 hours after that inflammation, they'll develop uh, necrosis and tissue injury that's very similar to necrotizing enterocolitis. So why panacells? Panacells, just as a real quick uh, reminder, they, they are uh, granulated cells that sit at the base of the intestinal crypts. Their job is to protect the intestinal stem cell niche. And they're chock full of antimicrobial peptides, chemokines, and cytokines. And they, they are constitutively, and uh, when they are exposed to different uh, stimuli, expressing these out into the lumen to help keep the stem cell niche sterile. Um, they can be disrupted by bacterial antigens, heavy metal chelators such as dithizone, um, and as we'll talk about a little later, interferon lambda, uh, which has become an important uh, component that we're looking at. Why are they important in neck? Well, my labs and others have shown that infants with neck have decreased numbers of PANA cells compared to um, age-matched controls of both intestinal damage and uh, of uh, non-damaged uh, infants of the same gestational age. Um, Dr. Sampath's work, who spoke at the last webinar, has shown that genetic mutations of panacell pathways have been associated with increased neck development. And in our hands in animal models, we can disrupt panacells and follow that with dysbiosis and cause a very similar pathology to what is seen in necrotizing enterocolitis. So this panacell seems to be a key uh, cell type uh, involved in necrotizing enterocolitis. So this is what the model looks like. When we look at injury scores, and we use an injury score similar to all the other uh, rodent models, it's a five-point score with uh, animal scores receiving a two or higher being consistent with necrotizing enterocolitis. And you can see that animals that have sham controls, animals that are given just Klebsiella or animals that are given just Dithizone don't have injury scores that are significantly above that level, but animals that have both hits are at an increased risk of developing intestinal injury that is consistent with neck. Now, when we put this in conjunction with the FEMI model, and I know these numbers are a little low, that's partially due to COVID and partially due to my move from Iowa to UC Davis. Um, but what we see is a very interesting pattern where we see the very similar, again, um, uh, pattern where the double hit in, in the neck model is the only thing that gives you significant increases in your injury, when we look at that in conjunction with the FEMI, it was really interesting because all of a sudden when we were just giving the specific Klebsiella but not disrupting Panacells, we were seeing increased amounts of injury. And that got us thinking that what's going on with Panacells and what's going on with um, this exposure to FEMI. So when we look at the exposure to FEMI and what that does to Panacell counts, you can see here that the sham animals are in gray, FEMI animals are in red, and these are just looking at the number of Panacells per crypt. Um, and you can see over time that 
the panis cells kind of come on at the normal time in this particular strain of mice, panis cells, cells show up somewhere between 10 and 14 days of age. So you have onset of panis cells, but then they start to lag behind. And the animals that were exposed to FEMI have decreased numbers of panis cells compared to their sham counterparts. When we do this further and we look in an interleukin-6 knockout animal, and remember I said that the interleukin-6 was really important to intestinal injury in this model, you can see that in looking at defensin-1, which is a gene that is specific to these panis cells, um, there's a decrease in that gene amount in the animals that are exposed to FEMI. But if you knock out interleukin-6, not only does that decrease go away, but there's actually a significant increase in the amount of this defensin that's there. And so again, the, the, the presence or absence of interleukin-6 seems really critical to this FEMI-induced loss of PANA cells. So that got us thinking about this interleukin-6. And when we look for where the interleukin-6 receptor is, it is present in the placenta, especially in the spongiotrophoblast layer, and it's present in the intestinal crypts. And this is looking at RNA scope uh, data um, specifically for interleukin-6 receptor. Interleukin-6 is kind of a complicated pathway. There are two ways that it signals. One is through a classical pathway and one is through a trans-signaling pathway. But the really critical part of this is you have to have two pieces. You have to have this GP-130, which is ubiquitously expressed across all cell types, but you also have to have an interleukin-6 receptor in order for the signaling pathway to happen. And when those two are come together with interleukin-6, the cytokine, it sets off a signal cascade which results in stat signaling. Why we think this is important is because there was a recent paper which came out recently, which showed that STAT1 activation went on to upregulate interferon lambda. And interferon lambda was then causative of inducing panacell death. And this was a really uh, beautiful study that was in gastroenterology in 2019 by Gunther et al. And basically what they looked at is they looked at injecting interferon lambda in uh, to mouse uh, in mice themselves, as well as a lot of different enteroid um, uh, systems. And what they found was that if you exposed animals to interferon lambda, that you can see here, then what that would do is that would decrease your cell, uh, your panacell cohort. And it did it through causing an apoptosis, which you can see in the figure here on the side. So we took this data and we took it to our FEMI model. And what we found was in looking at animals that have been exposed to FEMI, and you can see here in the panels, you've got P7 day old mice on the left, P14 day old mammals, animals on the right. These were animals that were exposed to FEMI just once and didn't have anything else done to them. And you can see that there are increasing numbers of interferon lambda in the animals exposed to FEMI, which is across the bottom, as opposed to the sham animals, which are across the top. Again, interferon lambda tends to hang around for a long time, um, very different from interferon gamma that we're a little more used to seeing. Um, and these animals at day 14 and day seven still have increased levels of interferon lambda in their tissues after that one exposure to FEMI. And this may explain why they have less panacells cells and also why they are having increased injury. This is a little bit about what we think is going on. The animals are, or humans for that matter, are exposed to um, FEMI or coriander amnionitis. That increases interleukin-6, which increases interferon lambda, which causes panacell cell death, which then allows the bacteria that are sitting uh, in the intestines of these infants or animals to get closer approximated to the intestinal tissue and set off the pathway that leads to necrotizing enterocolitis. Just to sum this, sum this up, um, we found that FEMI induces intestinal injury into the offspring weeks after exposure. Um, the loss of panacell function is dependent on uh, interleukin-6 and the injury is dependent on interleukin-6. Um, Interleukin-6 is found, or the receptor for it, is found in the uh, placenta as well as in the crypts, where we're interested in looking at necrotizing enterocolitis. And it seems that this interferon lambda piece is critical to this disruption of panacell biology. With that, I have to give thanks to the members of the McElroy Lab, especially um, Tim Elgin, Aaron Fricke, and Sarah Watson, who have been uh, just critical in pushing forward uh, this research. Uh, and with that, I will be happy to take any questions.
That's great. Thanks, Dave. That was, that was uh, uh, very interesting. I wanted to throw a couple of questions at you if we can. Uh, one is from uh, Cami Martin, who says, we see a late wave of injury after choreo uh, amnionitis, also with lung injury in infants born to choreo. So what are your thoughts on this early exposure conditioning and risk of injury later in the neonatal course? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I, I am not nearly as well versed with, with lung uh, injury. And so I, I would punt that a little bit to people that are more uh, in that realm of, of science. What I do know is that there, there's a two pronged piece when you think about this, there is the conditioning of the immune system. And that seems to be separate than at least what we've found with this interferon lambda piece, which is actually disrupting the, the PANA cells themselves. Um, however, you know, interferon lambda is around a lot and it seems to be um, able to move around different areas. And so what its impact is on the lung, I, I'm not sure. And I, I think is a, a area that um, is worthy of taking a look at. The second question, Steve, related uh, to antenatal steroids and our knowledge that antenatal steroids have an impact on reduction in incidence of neck. How does it impact the interferon lambda that you're talking about? Is it, could it, could it be a possibly upstream of that? Good question. No idea. Um, one of the, the most fascinating things about doing gut biology is that it's a really complicated system. And, you know, it, it may be that the steroid use is causing a shoring up or a, a maturing of the intestinal barrier function that then, um, you know, is enough of a boost that gets you over the fact that you've messed up your PANA cells, um, or it could have a more direct uh, implication. And we just, we haven't had a chance to look at that yet. And so I, I, I don't, I don't know at this time, um, the, the direct line of, uh, of effect of steroids on it. All right, final question. How can we prevent or reverse the intestinal cell injury following FEMI? Oh, man, that's a good question. Um, and could you know, HMOs benefit? I'll throw that. That, that is just came in. <laughs> <laughs> that is an awesome question. One that we're actually hoping to look a little bit more into. Um, you know, one of the great things about being here at UC Davis is that we're we're really fortunate to have um, a lot of people in the milk uh, biology arena and a lot of people that think very deeply about HMOs. I, I think that's something that we want to look into. Um, the interferon lambda is, is really strange biologically because it really just hangs around for a long time and, and really is going to cause apoptosis specifically of those PANA cells. And so, um, you know, we need to think of ways that we can either uh, support PANA cell growth and development or uh, come up with a way to shore up the, the infrastructure around the PANA cells so that their, um, the injury that's being done to them isn't as significant. Excellent. I'm going to, there's a, another question that came through, if you could respond to it in the Q&A, and I'm going to move on and hand over to Eleanor for our next speaker. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you Thanks. so much. Thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. I had loads of questions, but I've had to hold on because we have so many excellent speakers today. And we're delighted to have Dr. Erica Claude next, who is the Professor of Pediatrics in the University of Chicago and Director of Neonatology Research. Um, I was looking at your papers. They are really extensive, covering every area of neonatology and um, necrotizing enterocolitis, um, and especially in the microbiome. So we're really looking forward to this. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me go ahead and try to share my slides or go ahead and start by. Can you guys see that? Yep. All right, great. Um, so I have nothing to disclose. We'll go ahead and dive right in. So I've been asked to speak about the gut brain connection. I think there's a lot of evidence that what happens in the intestine affects the rest of the body. We certainly know that for necrotizing enterocolitis, this disease itself is a risk factor for poor neurodevelopmental outcome. The question though is why? Um, so is it inflammation? Inflammation from the gut leads to inflammation in the brain. Or is it nutrition? Because we don't, uh, we hold these babies NPO, we don't feed them. Is it possible that they're not getting key nutrients at key time points that are important for brain development? Um, 
Potentially, is it just immaturity, a baby who is susceptible to neck because they have an immature intestine? Perhaps they're also susceptible to poor neurodevelopmental outcomes because their brain is equally immature. Most likely, this is multifactorial, but I would like to um, put forward the uh, possibility that it's the microbiome that impacts preterm infant brain development, that it's the microbiome that is able to mediate this connection between gut and brain. So the microbiome is all the microbes in and on the human body. This can be bacteria or viruses, archaea. I'm specifically going to focus on bacteria. Um, and the largest population is actually found in the gut. So in the intestine, the microbiome actually has a genetic content, metabolic impact, similar to another organ. So if you're really going to think about human health, you really need to understand microbiome health as well, specifically the health of the gut microbiome. And when you think about the microbiome, you really need to think about it as a community ecosystem. A lot of times we think about bacteria as pathogens or commensal, good or bad, and it really doesn't function that way. It really functions the way you might think about another ecosystem, a forest or a pond. So a healthy ecosystem has a high diversity of species, balance, functional redundancy and resistance to disease. Whereas a sick ecosystem has a low diversity of species, imbalance, functional disability and susceptibility to disease. And I really wanna focus on this concept of functional because you're going to think about how in the world is the microbiome going to have an impact on something that's distant, that the microbiome perhaps isn't directly interfacing with. You really have to think about the function. So there's been a lot of work on the microbiome gut brain axis actually in the adult literature. So it's been shown that a healthy central nervous system is associated with a healthy gut whereas stress and disease may be also associated with gut dysfunction in sort of a simple term, sort of in the way if someone is anxious, they may feel upset in their stomach or um, children who have autism have GI manifestations. And there's many potential mechanisms by which the microbiota might have their effect. It could be through immune mod modulation, production of neurotransmitters, hormonal response, um, production of short chain fatty acids, or perhaps direct connection to the vagus nerve through the enteric nervous system. But as we know, there's many differences between an adult and an infant, and particularly for our preterm infants, what we know is that prematurity isn't really a disease state. It is a developmental state between fetal life and a full-term infant. And so this preterm infant has to undergo development in the context of this microbiome, not in the context of a sterile intrauterine environment. That was the expectation. So what is unique about the preterm infant is that host development coincides with microbiome development. And it's specifically been shown that there are parallel windows of microbiome and brain development. So if this is preterm birth on the early side around 23 weeks gestational age, and this is 40 weeks full-term birth, you can see there's already in this short time frame a change in microbiome stability that matches development of neuronal complexity including synaptic density, neuronal migration, exonal and dendritic growth, and that there are age-related microbiome dependent um, central nervous system development conditions um, such as ADHD or autism or on the other end of the age spectrum, Alzheimer's disease. But I actually wondered, is it possible that the microbiome influences development of the brain itself? And could that be relevant to what we're seeing in our preterm infants? Problem is that it's a little hard to model development. Dr. McElroy spoke a lot about mouse models and that's a very key tool for our research, but how do you model um, neuron development or brain development in a mouse model? Well, for preterm infants, for infants in general, development is often, um, can often be equated with growth and growth of our infants has been shown to be associated with improved outcomes. A growth is associated with adequate nutrition, um, resistance to illness, um, decrease inflammatory responses. So we decided to use this as our metric. And we use a notobiotic mouse model. So notobiotic just means known biota. Um, so we know what the microbiome colonization of these mice are. This is a tool that is used commonly in microbiome research, but I would like to make the case that it's probably pretty relevant or most relevant for our infants where there is a specific time point, birth, after which um, the mouse or the baby 
are rapidly colonized. In addition, there is a prolonged period of observation, regulated diet, simple communities, and known follow-up. So for our model, what we did is we transonated germ-free mice. So basically we took the microbiome from an infant of interest and gave it to the germ-free mouse so that the mouse now had a microbiome that represented an infant. And for our growth model, we took a fecal lysate that had the microbiome of an infant that had a phenotype or a, a physical finding that was what we were interested in, and that was growth. So we took a sample from a baby with good growth and a baby with poor growth. And we fed that to pregnant germ-free dams so that the mouse pups that delivered acquired their microbiome from their mother. That's sort of how it happens with babies too. And they acquired a microbiome that matched the infant of interest. And then we followed daily weight. And what we found was that high growth baby led to high growth mouse and low growth baby led to low growth mouse. mouse. And so now we had a model that we could look at. And we did look at many um, characteristics of the intestine at first. We looked at intestinal growth, tight junctions, panic cells, as were mentioned before, and the high growth microbiome led to increased maturation of all of those. But what I really wanna show you is this data. So this is data around the inflammatory response and L going forward will be low growth, H going forward will be high growth. And you don't need to know what all these letters are. Basically, these are all genes that are important for inflammation. And orange means that there was upregulation. And you can see there's a lot more orange in low growth than high growth. And we did not give a secondary inflammatory stimulus, sort of the way Dr. McElroy does in his model. This is just baseline based on the microbiome. The low growth microbiome led to an increased inflammatory phenotype in the mice. We look specifically at the intestine. So the microbiome is in most direct con um, contact with the intestine. And we saw the same thing. So here blue is low growth. This purple color is high growth. For each of the measured cytokines, there was increased expression in low growth compared to high growth. But then it wasn't confined to the intestine. When we measured levels in the serum, so the bloodstream of these animals, same thing, low growth had much higher levels than high growth. And so now this is potentially a way that the microbiome from the gut can be having um, distant effects. And when we looked at the brains of these same mice to look at an impact on neuroinflammation or inflammation in the brain, we looked at specific cytokines, IL-1 beta and CCL3, and we saw um, similarly that there was increased expression in low growth compared to high growth. It wasn't for all of them, so we didn't actually see a difference for IL-6, um, but we did see a difference in some of them. And then to take it one step further and demonstrate that this really was associated with the microbiome, it was a group that we gave a combination of low growth and high growth. That was the only difference. And we found that the high growth was able to rescue the low growth phenotype. So with the combination of the microbes found in the high growth, we were able to decrease this inflammatory response. But it wasn't just neuroinflammation. There was an actual impact on brain development. So first we looked at neurons. So those are the brain cells. We looked at new N. This is a marker of neurons themselves. Um, you can see in this quantitative graph, there's much more staining for high growth compared to low growth. And you can see it in these images as well, much more staining in high growth. We also looked at neurofilament expression. This is a measure of axon growth, much more in high growth compared to low growth. And then we looked at oligodendrocytes. So just to um, orient you, oligodendrocytes are the cells that support the neurons. They're also the cells that are responsible for producing myelin. There was no difference in um, uh, NG2, and this is a marker of oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. There was already a difference in um, oligodendrocyte transcription factor, which is a marker of um, oligodendrocyte differentiation. And then there was a difference in myelin basic protein expression. So this is the protein that um, covers the axons and uh, increases the speed by which signals can be sent. And you can see this not only in the um, quantitation based on the blot, but also in the staining. There's much more staining in high growth compared to like low growth. And then to take it one step further again, we did the same experiment where we combined the microbiome and you can see for these parameters as well, the high growth was able to um, rescue the low growth phenotype and make it more like the 
more mature high growth. So the next question became how, so these are um, associations that we're seeing uh, between the gut microbiome and the brain. How is it possible that we're having this effect? And we decided to look at um, IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factor, um, based on previous literature. So it's been known that mutations in the IGF-1 gene or receptor gene are associated with severe body growth failure, microcephaly, and developmental delay. In rodents, IGF-1 disruption results in reduced brain size and CNS hypomyelination. Germ-free mice have lower circulating IGF-1 compared to SPF mice, and IGF-1 is known to cross the blood-brain barrier. So when we looked at IGF-1 in our mice, what we found was that in the serum, there was increased IGF-1 in high growth compared to low growth. Interestingly, also in the brain. But there wasn't a difference in brain IGF-1 mRNA which suggests that it wasn't being locally produced, but the increased levels in the brain were actually coming from the serum. Again, this is potentially a pathway, um, pathway by which the gut microbiome may be impacting distant organs. So this has all been in mice, and we wondered, could we see similar findings in infants? How do we relate the two? Well, we really can't look at neuron cells or myelin in individual babies, but we can, again, turn to growth. We can look at head circumference growth, which is a marker of brain growth. As the brain grows, um, the head expands in size, size, and we have a mind cohort at the University of Chicago. This is microbiome and neonatal disease. And so the first thing we did was we just looked at um, head circumference growth in um, our cohort over time. So by gestational age, you can see that the two groups separated into a group that had appropriate head circumference growth and a group that had um, suboptimal head circumference growth. And what we found was there was a specific time point at which this separation started to appear and afterwards the distinction stayed. And this occurred right about 30 weeks gestational age or 30 weeks postmenstrual age. So we wondered if the microbiome is important for this, would we also see a change in the microbiome at the same time point? So for this, what we did was we took sequential longitudinally corrected, co uh, collected microbiome samples. And from the sequencing, we correlated um, all of the organisms to postmenstrual age. And we counted up the times that the microbiome change in relation to postmenstrual age. And we did just tallied those up. And this is a, called a change point analysis. And we found that for every um, sort of level of the microbiome, whether we were looking at phylum, family, genus, or species, the most change was seen right at 30 weeks. So this is a suggestion that the two might be co connected, but obviously there's many potential clinical confounders, gestational age at birth, sex, the birth weight and the birth head circumference, the type of nutrition these babies are getting, um, whether or not they have any inflammatory mor morbidities of prematurity, including necrotizing enterocolitis. So we did a random forest classification to determine the relative contribution of gut microbes as predictors of appropriate versus suboptimal head circumference growth trajectories when compared to clinical factors. So here's another um, sort of busy graph. You don't need to know what any of the words are. Um, this graph is from prior to 30 weeks. We took um, two, we did two analyses around that um, critical time point. So before 30 weeks and after 30 weeks and just focus on the purple. So the purple is the microbiome. Blue is um, mode of delivery. Orange over here is all the morbidities. Um, so this is retinopathy of prematurity um, sorry. Um, necrotizing enterocolitis is here. Closer to the bottom is um, birth, head circumference, growth, and sex. So this, by looking at all of these confounders, again, suggests that the um, microbiome is critical to the um, to head circumference growth. And just to confirm this, we look specifically at differences in a limited morbidity set. So this time we looked at the microbiome in babies who did not have neck or sepsis or retinopathy of prematurity, seizures, IVF or P or IVH or PVL 
Um, we did not exclude babies who had um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia because those numbers were high and they were equal numbers in both um, the appropriate head circumference growth and the suboptimal head circumference growth. So there didn't seem to be a difference based on that. And we found that um, even in this group, appropriate head circumference growth was associated with the microbiome, um, specifically increased levels of bacteriodota, lactosporaceae, and actinobacteriodota. So interestingly, um, in particular, bacteriodota and lactosporaceae are key members of the adult microbiome, and they've been studied quite a bit there. They are um, significant glycan foragers. They have um, significant production of short chain fatty acids. And in term infants, they've been associated um, with uh, brain connections. And then when we looked at um, pathways, functional pathways associated with the microbiome um, for appropriate head circumference growth versus suboptimal sub head circumference growth trajectories, um, we saw that the primary pathway that had an effect um, was carbohydrate metabolism, which may be associated with the short chain fatty acids, which we know are important for um, outcomes and neurodevelopment. So in conclusion, the microbiome impacts brain development independently. It may be associated with neuroinflammation, but it is actually more than that. It is associated with increased or altered neuron number and myelination. It may be having its effect through IGF-1. Um, it certainly has an impact on carbohydrate metabolism and short chain fatty acids. And I think the important part is that potentially this is a way to intervene um, because that is the promise of the microbiome, that it is actually modifiable for individual infants. So for future directions, there's going, we are going to be doing an ongoing functional assessment of the microbiome, as well as looking for biomarkers of a healthy microbiome and setting how and when to support a healthy microbiome. Because in the end, all of us really only get one. Um, so I think it's really important to understand how the microbiome is important for multiple health outcomes. And with that, I'll end and acknowledge the members of my lab, um, both uh, Caitlin Oliphant who, and Jing Lu, who did much of this work and the MIND team that was uh, critical for being able to enroll the patients that we were studying and my funding. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. And so all encompassing across translational paradigm. I was just, we have one question actually from Erin Hamilton to start with. Um, does the gut-brain axis from your models explain any of the paradox of improved neurodevelopment despite lower growth in human milk-fed babies? Um, so we are looking at that. One of the things that we are, so I don't have an exact um, answer to that, but I will tell you that we are following our babies out to age five. And I think one of the things that is interesting is how the neurodevelopment changes over time. So I think a lot of the outcomes up to about age two are really dependent on um, what happens in the NICU. And a lot of the outcomes past that are the um, environment that the baby goes home to. And across that, the microbiome is developing. So I think what we will end up finding is, you know, a lot of the studies have been on what are the microbes. And that's really why we are so focused on function. Um, I think that we, in particular, will learn a lot from the babies who are unexpected, and we certainly have those. The babies who seem to have a very rocky NICU start and have good development at age five, um, with those will probably be the babies who uh, perhaps did not have optimal growth and still have good outcomes later. I think what we will find is that there are key, um, key functions of the organisms and key times at which they are, are present um, to explain part of that. Now you've suddenly got a good few questions here. Thank you. One of them is how to build a good microbiome in babies who are admitted in the NICU. We use probiotics, but they usually have few bacteria. This is from Dr. Thakar. Uh, so how to build it. Um, yeah. So I do, I, I do think that's an important part. You know, we, we talk a lot about diversity. Um, so we having multiple organisms, uh, that can have redundant functions. And it's true, a lot of the probiotics, that's not actually improving your diversity. So I think what a lot of it, a lot of this will end up being over time is perhaps prebiotics or dietary supplements. Someone raised um, breast milk. I think that is actually going to be uh, more important than 
individual probiotics, and then also the specific metabolites, because I think it's going to be different things at different times. And so a lot of the probiotics are given right from the beginning and continued, and they're the same across the NICU course. And I don't think that's really how the microbiome develops. So I think we have to learn more, not only about what, but when. Perfect. And um, Elizabeth Rivera is, and just said, I might have missed it. Does modifying the microbe in your preclinical model and clinical study refer to fecal transplants? And if it is fecal transplants, is this done routinely in NICUs or only in research? So it's not done at all in um, NICUs. It is only research. And we are, so what we're doing is we are transplanting germ-free mice really as a way to study the infant microbiome, to create a model of the infant. We're not I certainly am not advocating for um, fecal transplants. I think a big question remains, what would we, what would the correct organisms be? And I think it's a whole um, separate long discussion about whether the microbiome that comes from the mother is really the best microbiome. I think that development is key and uh, a preterm infant needs microbes that are going to support the development. And that's not necessarily the same organisms you would find in an adult. Um, so I think we're a long way from that. I think this is really just a study tool to help us understand infants. No, thank you very much. That was brilliant. And I'm, I'm actually going to hand back to Jay because you're so perfectly on time um, that we can keep going. Thank you very much. Great. I'd like to introduce our third speaker. Dr. Kent Willis is a physician scientist and assistant professor at UAB or University of Alabama, Birmingham. His area of interest is focused on the commensal fungi or the myco. Uh, biome and how it influences newborn physiology and disease. And he's particularly uh, been asked to look at the gut lung axis as it relates to BPD or bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. So um, I was asked to talk about the gut lung axis and how it may uh, be related to necrotizing intercolitis today. So um, as the intro uh, indicated, my young lab actually we consider ourselves more to be lung researchers um, than uh, gut researchers, but um, part of what I want to show you today is how the gut may influence uh, physiology elsewhere in the body, um, particularly when things go wrong during necrotizing enterocolitis. Okay, so um, I have nothing to disclose related to the research today, but I have provided scientific advising to companies that develop uh, probiotics. So um, over the last decade, a bunch of different groups um, have looked at how the microbiome is established in preterm newborns. Um, particularly in relation to um, the two main severe diseases of prematurity, which are neck and BPD. Um, and, but most of the work in finding out how mechanistically this works has been done in other diseases, such as asthma um, and pneumonia. Um, and there have been a number of proposed potential links between um, the gut and other systems, such as the lung. And that could be um, in a, such as work by Dr. Deshmukhin. His colleagues um, showed that innate lymphoid type three cells, which are a type of uh, innate lymphoid cell are educated in the gut during the newborn period. And they traffic to the lung. The, that group was able to show that that influenced um, later your susceptibility to pneumonia, for example. And then other asthma related groups have seen uh, differences um, in T cell development in during the newborn period and how those T cells in the lung then later responded to infl inflammation. Um, but what we're just beginning to gasp is that there are a lot of things that need to be understood. And we have a very, a very early idea of what might may or may not be going on and how these systems might be related. Um, and particularly one of the things that has stood out um, to researchers of necrotizing enterocolitis is a predisposition of um, proteobacteria, which is a large class of bacteria that potentially precedes necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, and some of our group here at UAB, particularly Dr. Lal's lab, has um, identified some similar changes in human preterm newborns um, that may also precede bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Um, so as we were thinking about different mechanisms for how the microbiome of the lung or the gut are controlled, um, most of that work has been done in the gut. And we actually know very little about how the lung microbiome um, is um, controlled, but what we're beginning to get in hints of early research is that there may be very similar mechanisms at play. Um, in the gut, um, as the first speaker talked about today, one of the major mechanisms is secretion of antimicrobial peptides um, that help to regulate um, the microbiome um, on those various systems. So that keeping in mind, um, 
we started to ask ourselves, perhaps there is a gut lung axis um, in bronchopulmonary dysplasia and perhaps changes in the gut microbiome um, influence this inflammatory set point um, in the lungs. So one of the first experiments we did actually still while my, uh, was a fellow uh, in neonatology um, was an antibiotic exposure experiment where we used antibiotics to prevent transfer of a large portion of the microbiota from the mom to the um, corresponding offspring. Um, and so the mouse model of bronchopulmonary dysplasia is relatively simple to the neck model in that um, we use mice during the first two weeks of life when they're physiologically resemble preterm infants. Um, and if you expose them to very high concentrations of oxygen in here, instead of the regular 21% that's in regular air, we get exposed them to 60% oxygen or 85% oxygen for the first two weeks of life. And if that, you do that, um, they develop uh, an inflammatory related pause in lung development um, that causes them to have larger, more simplified alve um, alveoli, which are the sacs that do um, the major work of breathing. Um, and when our, this model, um, when we expose the maternal mice to significant doses of penicillin, um, we present, prevented, as you can see here in the top, a significant transfer of the microbiome. So in red in the first uh, bacteria by weight, you can see there's a logarithmic increase in the amount of bacteria that are normally passed from uh, a mom to her offspring uh, and from the perhaps over the first five to the first 15 days of life. And if you inject a significant amount of antibiotics as we did to the mother uh, through her drinking water, she prevented transfer of majority of that bacteria to her pups. Um, and so their bacteria was much more sparse and much more similar to like a five day old mouse. Um, and if you see under the principal contortance analysis or redundancy analysis, those mice that were exposed by water, which are the control mice, and those that were exposed to here, we called maternal antibiotic exposure or MAE. Um, they have microbiomes that are um, vastly different from each other. I and mean, then if you look over at the histology slides on the other side, uh, those mice that got maternal antibiotic exposure had significant differences in how their lung uh, architecture was structured. Um, most dominantly, those are changes within the interalveolar septi or the separation between the different lung sacs that was greatly enlarged in those mice that got a significant amount of antibiotic exposure. And similarly, those mice that got the combined exposure were actually more likely to die of severe lung disease um, than those that got um, just oxygen alone, for example. Um, to follow up on that, we performed a crossover experiment um, where we took mice where we exposed them either while the mothers were pregnant, um, and then we crossed them over and fostered them to a mother who was not exposed to antibiotics, or we did the opposite, um, where we took them the, the pups that were not exposed during pregnancy, and we crossed them over and exposed them to mothers who, had, who were on antibiotics for the next two weeks. And that resulted, as you might expect, in an intermediate phenotype between those mice that were exposed either not at all or completely um, to antibiotics. And these were led to changes in immune cell recruitment and to vascular density within the lung, as well as those changes in the architecture, which I mentioned earlier. So if those of you who have followed microbiome research are probably aware that the microbiome differs in the, so we say the transverse axis as you move down the intestine. So if you take a sample from the mouth, for example, it's pretty different from the stomach and that's pretty different from the intestine. Um, but what you may not be aware of is that the radial axis in between a particular intestinal segment also has results in changes in the microbiome. And particularly those microbes that are adhered to the cell layer beneath the mucus uh, layer that covers those cells are vastly different from the microbes that are on the opposite side in the lumen of the mucus layer and the, they're in the fecal stream. Um, and as we, while most microbiome research has been done on those fecal stream microbiota because they're easier to measure, um, it's becoming more obvious that those, the smaller subset of them that are actually adherent to the back to the cell wall and inter directly interact with the cells in the intestine are probably more biologically relevant um, to the host as they produce the majority of the metabolites and the majority of the immune stimulation. So we have other work has shown that the amount of radial oxygenation gradient changes as you go across the intestine. So if you start on the host side, the, there's an oxygen tension that's very similar to um, the rest of the, of the host. Um, and then that drops off dramatically as you move into the intestinal lumen. Um, and so this group, uh, Aldenberg et al. used hyperbaric oxygen to vastly increase the oxygen tension within the host. And they were able to measure that that gradient dropped dramatically across the lumen of the intestine. And that also altered the microbiome. 
So that in mind, we asked ourselves, well, perhaps the oxygen that we regularly give preterm babies to keep them alive might also influence the microbiome of their gut. So we went back to our mouse model that we've used before, and we looked at just hyperoxy exposure um, or just normal oxygen exposure. And we took those mice and we exposed them either to room air or to 85% oxygen. And we looked at changes related to oxygen exposure in the adherent microbiota of their small intestine, um, the perhaps most biologically relevant microbiota uh, to systemic health. And as you can see in blue, those are most mice that were exposed to room air and the red are those mice that were exposed to hyperoxia. There's significant differences in their microbiota. Um, one of the standout differences is the primary colonizer of that part of the small intestines, which are the bacteria in the general lactobacillus. Um, and as we are well aware for the most part, the lactobacilli have a wide um, potential for host interaction. So this stood out to us. When we talked to the Jilling lab, who I did the majority of this work with, um, had initially taken some of these samples and did a microarray several years ago. And amongst the vast number of differences in that changed in lung tissue related to hyperoxy exposure versus changes within the intestinal, uh, the intestine at the level of the ileum. One of the things that stood out to us when we were looking at our microbiome data was that the host's secretion of antimicrobial peptides, uh, which are primarily used to prevent, protect the host, as Dr. McElroy mentioned in the panacellic secretion, but also to help regulate the microbiota. Um, and one of the things that stood out to us within these cells were the vast differences between those normally exposed expression of, micro, of antimicrobial peptides and the profound drop in those mice that had been exposed to hyperoxia. Um, and this particularly stands out in relation to the principal antimicrobial peptide, which is lysozyme. Now shown here is lysozyme one. Mice have two different kinds of lysozyme, lysozyme one and lysozyme two. Lysozyme one is the intestine and lysozyme two is primarily other places like the lung. Um, so this difference here is related to lysozyme one. Um, humans only have one lysozyme gene though. Uh, so you would not expect, I said that, to, that lysozyme two would have changed um, and it did not come up in either one of our screens. So a recent group um, has shown that the lysozyme uh, uh, secretion changes over the first um, month or so in the mouse and over the first couple of years uh, of life in human infants. Uh, and they proposed that this was a developmentally related process um, and that perhaps there's a reason that perhaps this helps you colonize some bacteria versus others. Um, but one of the interesting things they followed up with was that maternal milk obviously contains a large portion of lysozyme. And for intestinal health, the maternal milk probably helps compensate for the fact that the baby isn't able to produce sufficient amounts of lysozyme to tamp down a well-developed microbiome. Um, but whether this is enough to cyst into other places in the gut where the, or in, sorry, outside of the gut where the lysozyme is not coming up from the breast milk, that remains to be seen. So taking the, that research versus our initial exposure of changes in lysozyme that result in hyperoxia, um, we decided to take lysozyme and gavage it back daily to uh, newborn pups as we expose them to hyperoxia. And so we continue to do that during their four, two week exposure period to oxygen. Um, and as you can see those in purple or in green here, those mice that got either hyperoxy exposure and lysozyme or just lysozyme have microbiomes that um, in both alpha and beta diversity, the two major metrics for microbiome development are vastly different um, from those that received vehicle, which in this case is just uh, phosphate buffered saline. And uh, those differences on a more specific level, those things that stood out to us most interesting was the differences in Staphylococcus, um, which is one of the other principal colonizers of intestine and which work in the lung has shown changes in relation to oxygen exposure um, in adults uh, previous before they get lung injury that the Staphylococcus blooms in their lungs. Um, so this stood out to us as a potential um, species that might be involved mechanistically. But the main interesting thing here is when we did RNA-seq on these intestines and lungs, those mice that got the lysozyme um, exposure had a robust differences in their gene expression of uh, here and again, antimicrobial peptides. Um, and then importantly, those mice that we gave lysozyme back um, actually had a protective um, on their lung injury. 
Um, and so in both long architecture, which is like measured quantified by mean linear intercept and the radial alveolar count, um, they had protective changes in long architecture. Um, and then resistance and compliance is their changes in their lung function that were actually slightly much more normalized compared to those mice that just received oxygen exposure. Um, we have been since followed up um, on our mouse work using intestinal organoids. And these was um, work that we did in correlation with Amy McConnell and her excellent neck lab at Harvard. Um, and then we've been further exploring this with other uh, mouse models. So this is a vendors associated model where we used mice that we sourced from various different uh, vendors. So they have a similar genetic background, but they have vastly different microbiomes depending on where they were raised. Um, and when they are exposed to hyperoxia, they have different um, changes within their uh, lung architectural response to oxygen exposure. Uh, similarly, the law lab and one of my our fellows, Amelia Freeman, um, has followed up on our previous work showing that germ-free mice are protected from lung injury. Um, and they, she's used um, tracheal aspirates to colonize um, germ-free mice um, here with either humanized preterm, which were babies that did not get bronchopulmonary dysplasia, or humanized BPD, which were mice that were colonized with babies that got BPD. And we were able to show that that altered their response to hyperoxy exposure as well. Because germ-free mice have persistent differences in immune development that even when colonized with bacteria do not quite fully normalize, um, we used a pseudo-humanized model where we used large doses of antibiotics um, in the mothers to wipe out their colonize, and then we used fecal microbiota transfer to transfer over either human or uh, BPD or human non-BPD associated microbiomes um, from babies in our NICU. Um, and then we did, were able to do similar experiments uh, showing differences in hyperoxy exposure lung architecture. So in summary, human infants have guts and lung microbiomes that bidirectionally influence each other uh, in systemic health and disease. Maternal antibiotic exposure alters the severity of bronchopulmonary dysplasia and hyperoxy exposure alters the production of, of the microbiome and host production of antimicrobial peptides. And uh, we have a bunch of future work, most of which as we mentioned is actually focused on fungi and how fungi are related in the lung and the gut um, as well that are not quite ready for prime time. So I'd like to thank my various different funding sources, uh, my collaborators in this work particularly are Tomas Gilling and Amy O'Connell, um, as well as my funding from the NIH and the UAB. Um, and if you didn't see a picture by the slide, that means it was probably done by Ahmed Abdelgawad in my lab or myself. And with that, I'd like to answer any questions. That's great. Uh, it's a fascinating observation that you're seeing, and, and I don't see any questions right now yet. But I'll throw some uh, one at you. Um, so I, I want to better understand what you think is going on when uh, with the lung injury that, that uh, and prevention of lung injury. So what do you postulate is the connection there? So I think at the moment, most of our early stuff is related to changes in immune set point. Um, so we think that the microbiome probably educates your early immune set point, various different innate set subtypes, whether that's innate lymphoid cells or um, B regulatory cells um, during this portion of, of early newborn period. And then if you've been exposed to uh, either an insufficiently complex microbiome or a microbiome that's maybe disrupted in some way by inflammation, uh, your immune set point in your lungs is different. And so thus you have a more robust inflammatory experience that probably downstream causes more lung injury. So in humans, and I don't know in rodents and humans, there's issues of the oral microbiome and the potential say in, in the ICU where there's um, uh, potential for inhalation or the effect of from oral to lung, but I don't know in rodents if that's another route uh, one wanted you to comment on oral microbiome and, and how much giving stuff might be affecting. So it is still very much controversial what the source of the lung microbiome in particular is, whether it's aspirated gut contents, whether it's aspirated oral contents, whether it's intrinsic microbiota. Uh, I think the evidence is sufficient enough to say now it's probably a combination of all three of those things. Um, and it's probably a continuous conveyor belt, right? That you're also mm -hmm. up and the mucus is expelling microbes, but you're producing more 
Um, so do I think it's possible that the oral microbiota influences the lung microbiota either directly as it contributes to seeding parts of the lung? Yes. Um, is it possible that they also affect each other via immune differences? Yes. Um, and then one of my colleagues here, Samuel Gentle has done, uh, some work in human babies to show that their oral microbiome does can be used to predict whether they will develop bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So whether mechanistically what that is, we're still trying to work on that. And that's actually what one of the, that pseudo germ-free model, that's what part of that is designed to answer. So. Excellent. We're right on time. Appreciate the, the, the answering the questions and we're going to move on and Eleanor is going to present our, or introduce our last speaker. Fantastic. Thanks very much. I have loads of, we have so many questions as moderators for the speakers, but we have to be good and keep the session going because um, keeping to time is so important, but that was a fantastic talk as well. Um, and I think you answered all of your own questions as you went through so elegantly. Um, but now our last speaker is um, Dr. Chris Stewart. Hi, Chris, how are you? Um, Hi, yeah, good. How are you? Nice to see you. Um, who is um, from Newcastle. And he is um, a Wellcome Trust and Royal Society Fellow, his very prestigious award. And um, he's also written many seminal works in the area of the microbiome, especially in neonates, um, and has multiple publications in this area. So it's actually a pleasure to hear him speak today about the developing intestinal microbiome, determinants during the neonatal period and implications for health. So thanks, Milan Chris. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Thank you also to the Next Society for the invitation um, to present this evening or uh, afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. So yeah, as the title suggests, I'll be talking about the intestinal microbiome, but for this audience, um, I'll be focusing that on preterm infants and then talking about some of our recent work in necrotizing enterocolitis or NEC. My disclosures and disclaimers. So just to give a very brief overview of what we're doing here in my group in Newcastle in the northeast of England, we rely very heavily on clinicians to access clinical samples. And for the purposes of what I'll present today, that will be primarily tissue and blood uh, and also stool samples. We then use omic technologies to really learn as much as we possibly can about these different sample types. And so that can span all the way from microbiome sequencing to find out what microbes are colonizing these different samples all the way through to understanding the functional small molecules or metabolites that are produced by that host microbial interaction. We then use a range of model systems to, to unpick this a bit further to understand the, the underlying mechanism. And actually you've already heard from this evening and in the previous session from Misty about the importance or potential utility of organoids derived from, from preterm infants diagnosed with neck, but also non-neck related um, resections. And of course, the hope is always to translate this back into the clinic, be it in the form of novel diagnostics or, or therapeutics. And so I think we have an increasing appreciation, both in the scientific community, but also in the public, that the microbes play important roles in health and not only disease. And so here's a non-exhaustive list of some of the really fundamental roles that microbes play in infant health um, from birth. But of course, if there's an imbalance or what some will call a dysbiosis of that microbiome, it can lead to a range of different diseases. We've just heard about VPD earlier. We also know, obviously, in this audience, a lot about necrotizing enterocolitis. And these diseases aren't mutually exclusive either. So, of course, sepsis can often be linked to um, diseases such as NEC. So to summarize probably three or four years of my postdoc at, at Houston, uh, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, we... Um, analyzed the Teddy cohort. This was an unbelievable um, collection of samples from, in this case, term infants from birth all the way through into early childhood. Um, and from all of that analysis, when we asked what were the main factors really driving the microbiome development during infancy and childhood, it was very clear that breast milk was the, the primary driver of that. And you can see here as, as breast milk is slowly reduced in the diet over the first year of life, you see that corresponding reduction in several different bifidobacterium species. And from all of our modeling, it was very clear that bifidobacterium is inherently linked to the amount of uh, breast milk that's in the infant diet. And we think that's probably due in large to human milk oligosaccharides. We have already had a question on HMOs for those that aren't familiar 
with um, human milk oligosaccharides. They're the third most abundant solid component of breast milk. Um, they provide no direct nutritional benefit to the infant, but they do reach the small and large intestine intact, where they can, as I said, provide growth substrate for different microbes, in particular bifidobacterium. And of course, there's an interesting sort of tangent to that, that if HMOs have a role beyond just prebiotics, and there's an emerging evidence to suggest that might well be the case, that actually what you may not want is an overgrowth of these different bifidobacterium species utilizing these human milk oligosaccharides and then preventing them from potentially having their immunomedulatory or even acting directly upon the host epithelium in terms of the epithelial function uh, and development. So here based in, in Newcastle, uh, I'm very fortunate to work alongside two fantastic neonatal consultants in Janet Barrington and Nick Embleton. And of course, we heard from Nick last week. And within our uh, neonatal intensive care unit, we collect basically all samples from all babies who are born less than 32 weeks gestation and less than 1500 grams at birth. And we've been collecting these samples now for over a decade. And there's more samples than what I presented here, but this will give you a flavor as to the majority of samples which we hold. And then the different type of omic technologies that we typically employ um, on those samples, as I said, to really learn as much as we can about the microbiome, about the host microbial interaction. And so it's worth noting that all of these samples are housed within our Great Northern Neonatal Biobank here in Newcastle, as is the data which we've generated from these samples. And so if you are interested in either accessing that data or indeed the samples themselves, we're always very happy to, to have those conversations. We have put a lot of effort into collecting these. So it's always great when, when researchers across the community are interested and keen to use them. And as I said, I'll talk a little bit later about some of the work we're doing around resected tissue, in particular, using that tissue for generating organoid lines. But before I get into that, I wanted to give an overview of some work that we've done on the microbiome and then also with regard to the human milk oligosaccharides in this preterm population. And so using the Great North Neonatal Biobank and in collaboration with the Starty Medical, who um, at the time were able to sequence a lot of our uh, preterm stool samples using metagenomics, um, we were able to generate, in this case, a data set of healthy infants only, where we have 125 infants, or 124 to be precise, with longitudinal sampling. And in total, we have 1,477 samples passing all our internal QC. And again, much like I had done previously with the sort of Teddy cohort, we asked what were the primary factors of all the aspects of sort of neonatal care that we typically considered to be important of these, what can we reproducibly see as being drivers of the microbiome development? And to our surprise, factors like delivery mode, which in a term population will have an impact over the first year of life. In this population, over this more acute time frame, up to day 70 of life, didn't have any uh, significant impact or association with the microbiome development. And on the flip side, as you would probably well expect, probiotics was the strongest factor and also the most consistent across pretty much all the time points except the first, whereas the average day of life where infants began their probiotic administration was around day eight. So that possibly explains that first time point there. So as I said, we rather expect this because probiotics, as many will appreciate, is the deliberate administration of these viable bacteria to the preterm infant. Therefore, you're adding a lot, huge numbers of DNA from these bacteria into the infant gut. And so you would expect to start to detect those DNA sequences in the stool, and that's exactly what we have done here. So microbiome data sets, as anyone who's ever uh, handled this type of data will attest, is can be quite complex, especially when you get into the realm of having thousands of, of different samples, and especially with metagenomic data sets where we can get down to sort of species level resolution. So one thing that we, we often do to really reduce that complexity is to use an algorithm to give us an optimal number of what we call preterm gut community types or PGCTs. And you can see in this case, the algorithm has um, found that five different clusters is the optimal number for explaining this particular data set. And you can see we've deliberately numbered those clusters one through to five, where the earliest samples, those collected at the lowest day of life are uh, on average in cluster one, and then cluster five contains on average the oldest samples 
And having done some statistics on this, clusters four and five were significantly older or more mature than compared to the other clusters. And that's somewhat um, recapitulated here in the microbes that we see. So we know from birth in preterms and also term infants, we detect a lot of staphylococcus. And again, we see that in the earliest cluster here. Escherichia tends to dominate cluster two, Klebsiella in cluster three, and clusters four and five are made up largely of bifidobacterium. But you'll note that there's different species of bifidobacterium and cluster five here in particular has dominance of bifidobacterium brevi. So I don't expect you to remember what the underlying composition of the clusters is when it's important, I'll present it on a slide, but just to note, this is really a way of simplifying very complex microbiome data. And you do so with the assumption that there's some um, consistency between these different samples in, in the ultimate function. And, and we'll go on to that in a few slides time. So um, using those clusters, then we can start to apply some sort of novel and interesting uh, different analyses. A plot like this, which I'll show on this slide and in a slide in a few slides time, we have in columns the different day of life time windows. So here you can see day node to nine, and this stems all the way through to day 50 to 69 day of life. And then here you can see the different preterm good community types across each row. And so, as I said, most infants begin life in, in cluster one. That's the Staphylococcus dominant cluster. And then in our population that never received probiotics, and this is before probiotics were ever introduced onto the unit, you can see that those infants generally transition to community types two or three, so the Escherichia or the Klebsiella dominant community types. We then introduced Impleran onto the unit, which is a probiotic containing B. bifidum and Lactobacillus acidophilus. B. bifidum is a bifidobacterium. And again, you see uh, that the, most infants will start in cluster one, but very quickly we'll start to transition towards this preterm gut community type five, which is dominant in bifidobacterium brevi. And notably that particular bacterium is not part of the um, composition of Impleran. And we also tried to culture bifidobacterium brevi from Impleran in case it was there as a sort of contaminant, but, but we were unable to culture it. Uh, and then finally, we introduced more recently Labanic onto the unit. This has the same species, different strains of B. bifidum and Lactobacillus acidophilus and the addition of a B. infantis. And we see here again, most infants start in community type one, but in this case, they transition into community type four. And so as you'll have already gathered from this, you can see that we can very deliberately manipulate the preterm gut microbiome based on the administration of, in this case, probiotics. Um, and as I said, I'll talk a bit more about the potential functional implication of that in a few slides time. Before I get onto that, I want to introduce um, some work which was published uh, last year. I said it's 2020, it's actually 21. It was accepted in 2020. So here we have 33 neck infants and we matched them um, to 37 controls. This was work that was led by uh, my fantastic PhD student, Andrea Massey, and in collaboration with Professor Lars Bode in UC San Diego. So Lars helped us profile the human milk oligosaccharides in, in breast milk samples from our infants. And we did so in infants, uh, as I say, who went on to develop neck compared to match controls. You can see very clearly from this ordination that the HMO profiles of infants who develop neck are significantly different to their matched counterparts. And when we looked at what the underlying HMO driving this difference was, it was very clear that it was disilactoenteteros or DSLNT. And so we can provide, uh, do some reasonably uh, simple modeling, in this case, just a univariate model to determine that 241 nanomoles per mil is the optimal threshold or cutoff for um, this particular HMO, where above that, most of our controls are based and below that, you'll see most of the neck infants. So here's a single sugar present in mother's milk, um, which we think can, in this cohort, at least predict neck onset with a very high sensitivity and specificity of 0.9. And then really nicely kind of supports some work that Lars had done earlier, um, where he was able also to show that DSLNT is higher in controls compared to neck, and in particular, those infants with stage bells two and three. Uh, I'll just skim over that in the interest of time to mention that we also produced a similar analysis as to what I just showed earlier, categorizing infants as above or below DSLNT threshold. And you can see that those infants above the threshold generally transition into these more mature community types in four and five, 
whereas those infants receiving below the threshold and therefore more likely to develop neck didn't show that same um, transition. And again, we applied statistics to that and that was a significant difference. So as I said earlier, does this have any functional implication? And so this is slides I was um, still adding over the last hour or so, so very uh, fresh to the slide deck and, and very hot analysis out of the lab, which when we looked at metabolites from stool samples, we took 10 samples from each preterm gut community type and they were matched for age. This was led uh, by Lauren Beck and was done in collaboration with Ben's Marsland. So Lauren's another one, another fantastic PhD student of mine and Ben is based at Monash in Australia. And we found again that here, looking at the functional small molecules in these samples, there does seem to be a, a functional implication. And so you can clearly see from this ordination that those least mature samples or community types are here on the left, and then they generally transition towards cluster five here on the right. And we see the exact same thing with the serum samples as well. So we often get asked when we talk about preterm good community types, okay, you have a difference in the microbes based on their identities, but is there any functional ramification of that? And it does seem to be the case that there is. So in the last minute, I just wanted to talk about the organoid work that I promised you. And again, this is really already been introduced by Misty last week uh, fantastically well. So we can now isolate the stem cells and generate these 3D mini guts in the lab. We can do this from any intestinal resection. So across the different regions of the small intestine and the colon. But the crux of this, especially when you're thinking about host microbiome interaction is how you model the oxygen gradient. We heard in the previous talk about how important that oxygen gradient across the epithelium is. And so we developed a couple of years ago, a model system whereby you can take those 3D organoids, make them two dimensional, and then you can control that steep oxygen gradient across the epithelium, allowing you to provide oxygen to the human cells whilst keeping the bacteria in an anaerobic and physiologically relevant um, environment. And so when we've done some experiments, we can basically prove that we can grow anaerobic bacteria in this system so proof of concept. Interestingly, the cells respond in that hypoxic environment to um, have a down regulation of IL-8. So they seem to be less stressed in that environment. And that is actually mirrored not only at the expression, but also at the cytokine level. So when we use our anaerobic core culture system, we see IL-8 to be significantly lower than when they're in their normal incubation condition. So we do feel that they're, even if you're not particularly studying uh, viable anaerobic bacteria, the cells are just much happier in the environment in which they're used to. So um, just in the interest of time, I'll, I'll leave it there so I can say a massive thank you to the various members of, of my team, including Claire, who I know is on the call tonight and has done some amazing work around secretory IgA, some of which is published and some of which is to come, uh, to Janet and Nick, who make all of this work possible and then to the the various collaborators and, and funders and with that I'll thank you for your attention and, and take any questions you might have. Well, that was a fantastic talk Chris. Um, I don't know I, I'm getting some questions here so I better hold mine. Um, from the slide on the clinical variables associated with the preterm gut microbiome why do you think that breast milk water virus had a best of, had a better effect than most of the other clinical variables? Why do you think that the effect for breast milk port fire is more sustained than breast milk? Um, very... I suppose just as a sort of semantic point, this is more of an association than an effect. And, and, and it's not to say it's better or worse, just that um, it was significant. So, so the fortify one is, is interesting. We have done an analysis around that particular variable because as you, as the person who asked a question rightly pointed out, it was one of the few other than probiotics, which we've seen to be significant at more than one time point. So there doesn't seem to be any, any particular taxa or anything in their alpha diversity. So the Shannon diversity, the richness or the evenness that, that is different. So, so although it's significant, it's, it's relatively minor. Um, and ultimately we are trying to unpick and understand that better, but it, it's a very good question. And I suspect we, we might need a focused study if, if we're to really understand if if yeah, if that's a true um, impact. And can I ask a question about um, DSLNT and its um, functional effects? Do you think there's any functional effects on systemic inflammation 
um, and systemic immune cell infiltration into organs such as gut and lung and brain? Yeah, so it's a, it's a fantastic question and, and one that we are certainly actively looking at now. The one slide I skimmed past is some actually fantastic work by Lars. Um, so I didn't slip, skip by for any other reason than time, but, but they were able to show that that DSLNT impact is, is specific to the structure of DSLNT. And when you slightly modify that structure, you lose, um, at least in a rat model, the, the anti-inflammatory properties. And so, yeah, um, do we, so we can do some experiments and we have recently done a lot, don't have the data in, in, in shape where I could have showed it today, but we've started to add these different sugars, including DSLN2 to the organoids in the core culture hypoxic environment and um, looking at whether or not it's it's actively sort of transported over the epithelium layer looking at the response the gene response to the presence of those different HMOs to and that's without any bacteria so to understand some of that more I guess fundamental biology is is our HMOs truly only prebiotic so or is there some sort of immuno uh, modulatory role there as well that's pretty cool now, I suppose I better not be hogging the questions. I don't know if any of the other panellists have any questions for you or any of the other speakers before we wrap up. I don't know, Jay, if you have any questions for anyone. Stop sharing. No, nope. I think I asked mine. I think the, the last talk with you was very exciting. Yeah, if there's no other questions, I'm, I'm happy to wrap us up. So thank you to our amazing speakers. Um, and just a friendly reminder that our webinar that took place on January 28th, that recording is now available. If you go to our website, it's on our YouTube channel. And then um, just a, an invitation to join us on Friday, February 18th at 10 a.m. Eastern time um, for another webinar. So we hope to see you again soon. And the, today's recording will be available soon. So stay tuned for that. Um, I also want to share that May is NEC Awareness Month. May 17th is NEC Awareness Day. Um, you can stay tuned for some announcements we'll be having having as May approaches. We do have an online shop with some cool Next Society gear if you're interested in checking it out. Um, so thank you so much again to all of our speakers, to all of our community members, and to Matilda's family for sharing um, this beautiful sweetheart with us. So thank you for carrying her memory, and we hope to see you on Friday. Thanks, everybody.